Good morning. I got to do a wedding yesterday and baptisms today. <laughs> that that's, makes for a very good weekend. Baptisms are one of the, my favorite things to do because it represents a fresh start in life. I'm so grateful for those who made that decision. Uh, we're continuing in our series in Moses, and it's called Surprised by Grace. And uh, have you ever thought or heard someone say something like this? I would believe in God if maybe if they saw a miracle. Um, when you think something like that, do you think that's true? Do you think people who see miracles automatically believe in God? Uh, we're looking at the life of Moses, and uh, Moses has a brother. His brother is three years older than he is. His name is Aaron. And uh, God is using them to help bring freedom to a nation that's been in bondage, slavery for over 400 years and they are in bondage to the strongest military uh, country in the world at that time. And so Moses and Aaron have already had one meeting with Pharaoh. It did not go uh, particularly well. He was not impressed by them or influenced by them. He wasn't convinced about anything. And so what happens now is chapters 7 through 11 begins to talk about some extraordinary events that take place so that it looses the grip that Pharaoh has on these slaves. And uh, uh, you can find where these are as you read through these chapters in Exodus. Uh, you can find them because it always starts with the same phrase. The phrase is, the Lord said to Moses, now something is going to happen. Uh, we often refer to these things as the plagues. And it's interesting that we call these events plagues because the Bible actually doesn't call them that. Uh, that. That's not the word in the original language. The word in the original language is more like a strike or a blow. And in other places in Scripture, it's actually referred to as signs and wonders. Something that's supposed to point to God. So I'm going to read uh, a little bit longer passage today. Not all of the uh, signs and wonders that uh, God worked through Moses and Aaron, but uh, a couple of them. So we're in Exodus chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. That's a really important phrase. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my divisions. Divisions is a military term. He's talking to slaves. They've never seen themselves like this. I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. That's an important phrase. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff, throw it down before Pharaoh, and it will become a snake. How many would prefer that I do not perform that today? Yeah. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron threw down his staff in front of Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians also did the same things by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff, and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard. And he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes out to the river. Confront him on the bank of the Nile and take your hand, take in your hand the staff that was changed into a snake. Then say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, let my people go so they may worship me in the wilderness. By the way, that's a really important distinction. Everybody thinks that all Moses says is let my people go. 
And what he always says is, let my people go so they may go and worship. But until now, you have not listened. This is what the Lord says. By this, you will know that I am the Lord. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile and it will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die. The river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams, the canals, over the ponds and all the reservoirs, and they will turn to blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in vessels of wood and stone. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water of the Nile and all the water was changed to blood. The fish in the Nile died and, and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. But the Egyptian magicians did the same things by their secret arts, and Pharaoh's heart became hard. He would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Instead, he turned and went into his palace and did not take even this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile to get drinking water because they could not drink the water in the river. Just two points I want to make. Uh, this morning out of these passages. And the first is the signs of God are given to reveal God. The signs of God are given to reveal God. Uh, over and over, we see that uh, these signs are including the phrase, you can find this in chapters uh, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 14, this phrase. God did something so that they would know him. God wants to be known. And uh, God knew that Pharaoh would ask for a miracle. And so he kind of prepped Moses for that moment. And he takes his staff and throws it down and it becomes a snake. Uh, Pharaoh actually winds up dismissing what, what Moses and Aaron did because he has sorcerers and magicians who can do the same thing. And next he, he goes down to the water and, and, and the water is turned to blood. Now, some people think that, you know, maybe they just threw some kind of color dye in there and, and uh, maybe red dye number two and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And, but whatever this was, it was so bad that fish could not survive in it. People could not drink it. It wasn't just not pleasant to look at. It, it had a very bad odor and the animals that depended on the water couldn't survive it. And... Uh, and, and the fish died, the frogs actually fled the, the Nile. That, that was another sign that's going to be upcoming. And uh, when, it, when it got to the frog thing, uh, Pharaoh actually asked Moses for some relief. Uh, you might not think frogs would be a problem, but they were everywhere. They fled the Nile and there were, I can't imagine how many millions of frogs up and down the Nile and they just had gone into everywhere. And then on top of that, the frogs died. And when they died, there were all these flies that came. How many know flies will tend to come to dead things? And yeah, I mean, it was just, it was a mess. And uh, so he said, you know, you have to help. Pharaoh said, relent, like take the pressure off. And Moses responded. And uh, Pharaoh didn't change his heart. He just wanted circumstances to change. In this passage, we're learning something about God, but we're also learning something about Pharaoh. So God is providing throughout all of these signs opportunities for Pharaoh not just to change his mind, but to change his heart. And the thing about heart change, if that doesn't happen, whatever decision we make now, we'll go back and remake later on. And uh, Pharaoh's got this idea that because his magicians are able to do the things that Moses and Aaron are doing, that that must mean that God is not real. And uh, in this, God is not changing the will of Moses. He's revealing the will of Moses. He's showing what's inside of this man, every one of these signs and wonders. And so we, th there's going to be a 10 of them in all, technically 11 if you count the, um, the staff. And uh, we're not going to talk about the last one because we'll talk about that next week. Uh, there are also some um, 
theologians and, and people who write commentaries that have thought that the, uh, these signs and wonders kind of uh, uh, showed the Egyptians that the gods that they worshipped were unworthy. Because, for example, they worshipped the River Nile. Imagine your god becoming, uh, you cannot get any life out of that any longer. Uh, the, the sun and the moon were gods that they worshipped, uh, very important. Uh, Pharaoh was considered a god, but the sun and the moon, and there's going to be three days of darkness that will come over the land. Now, we're going to experience a solar eclipse across uh, next year across our region, and, and uh, it'll be a complete solar eclipse. The sun will be completely blotted out. That, that lasts for about seven to ten minutes. Uh, they would experience a darkness that lasted for three days. Some of the signs also seem very natural, like if the, if the water's undrinkable and the animals flee and then they die and then flies come, like, isn't that what you'd expect? But some of the signs seem completely unnatural, like the darkness that would be over the entire land of Egypt for three days, but not over Goshen, which is an area that the Israelites lived in. It was kind of like the slave quarters of the nation. Uh, none of the signs affected Israel where they lived until we get to the Passover. Once again, we'll talk about that more next week. There are uh, some occasions that uh, Pharaoh conceded some ground. He would say things like, well, why don't you just worship here? Make your sacrifices to your God, which was not a small thing for him to uh, relent to because he was considered a god and obviously the Egyptians had their own gods to allow sacrifices to another god that was not their gods could have been seen as unwise and yet Israel said that that's not enough then then he said well you can go but leave your children behind because uh, Pharaoh knew that parents aren't going to go far or stay long uh, when your kids are left behind and uh, every time this is really interesting. Every time Pharaoh agrees to let Israel go to worship, we, we see his real heart. And he changes his mind back to what it was. So what is God doing? Signs are given to reveal God. What are we learning about God in these signs? What we are learning is he's giving opportunity after opportunity after opportunity for someone to change their heart. God could very easily have just had one mighty blow, one strike that would eliminate the entire Egyptian army, and they would have been in chaos while the entire nation of Israel walked out free. That's not who God is. That's not how God works. What God is doing is he's giving opportunity after opportunity. What is that called? That's called grace. How many opportunities have you had? Grace. Is there anybody in the house that's grateful that we have a God who gives us more than just one opportunity? <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Grace. So Pharaoh is using grace, but how is he using it? He's using it to strengthen his own will. Every time an opportunity passes and he just simply does what he wants. And he comes to believe that nothing is ever really going to change. And, and, and so God desires, this is interesting, God actually tells those people, I want this story to be told in every generation. And I have to tell you that for, for modern people in Western culture, they don't like this so much. This frustrates them. Why would you tell a, a story about a God who seems capricious and, and, he, and he's trying to hurt people and, and he's trying to force people's will? And it proves that they don't understand the story. The story is about... Let my people go so that they may worship. And here's what's really fascinating. With every one of these signs, with every one of these blows, God always takes the pressure off before Pharaoh answers. Always takes the pressure off before Pharaoh responds. Why does he do that? Because God is not trying to get the answer Pharaoh would give under duress. He wants to see the answer Pharaoh gives that's actually his conviction. Who is this person really? That's a very powerful thing for us to know. And we should think about that. What is God doing? Signs are given to reveal God. And he's revealing something of his grace in all of this. 
As I said, these kinds of story can anger people if you interpret it as God's just bullying somebody in submission. But before you get too far along that line and, and maybe side with that, don't forget that these people had been 400 years in abject slavery. And God is doing something about it. You'll hear people say that the Bible is pro-slavery. Then explain the book of Exodus. If God is pro-slavery, why does he deliver an entire people who've been enslaved out of bondage? He's giving opportunity after opportunity. God brings pressure, and then he released the pressure, and then Pharaoh responds. Uh, centuries later, uh, we're going to see Jesus walking through Israel and performing signs and wonders. And he also wants to reveal something of the heart of God. And you would think that when people see sick people that get well and blind people that can see and deaf people that can hear and lame people that can walk and leopard people who are made whole and clean again and multitudes of hungry people fed. When, when you see all of these things, people would just go, yes, this has to be a God thing. But just like Pharaoh, the Pharisees also did not believe when they saw the signs and wonders. Miracles do not reveal do not change our mind about God. It reveals our heart about God. We need to think about that. I would believe in God if he gave me the numbers of the lottery. And then what would you do with those numbers? Oh, I would play the numbers. And I would get the money. That's good. And what would you do with that money? And some of us have a very detailed plan. Don't we? We do. Jesus would do great miracles. God is showing great restraint. Great restraint. That's grace. Pharaoh would ask God, get rid of the painful and hard things. And God would do that. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. Over and over, God would do that. There's even one of these signs where there's going to be hail, such a fierce hail storm that it destroys crops and even humans that are in the field and livestock that are in the field are going to die. And God actually warns them, hail's going to come, the worst hailstorm you've ever seen. It's going to destroy crops and it's going to do damage to, to, to humans and livestock. Get them to safety. Why would God do that? Why not just catch them by surprise? God is not a dictator. God does not use his power to impose his will on others. And when God uses his power, our will is the one that gets revealed. What's going on inside of you? I know there are some people who get frustrated with God. They wish he would be a dictator. Just force people to do the right thing. God has unlimited power, but he will not use it in uncontrolled ways. So God uses signs to reveal something about God, but the signs of God are also intended to rescue people from bondage. And this is important. A lot of theologians talk about that the signs make it look like the created order is, is being undone. For example, like darkness came on the earth and before creation, everything was dark. And I think there's a really powerful message in there that, that when human beings ignore the wisdom of God, that we undo creation in nature in a way that it leads to chaos and causes harm to lots of people. And sign after sign, we're seeing nature undone. Uh, it wouldn't just happen there. On a cross, centuries later, as human beings use their power like dictators to bludgeon the human body on a cross until there's no life left in it. They're going to impose their will. And they're going to make Jesus an example. They only have room for their own ideas and everyone else must be damaged. 
And in those moments when human beings act like that, it happened again. Darkness comes all over the earth, all over that region. Because when we act outside of the will of God, we undo our lives. That the commands of God are not intended to limit our life, that the commands of God are intended to help us live our life to the full. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Chaos, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. That's God's intentions for us. What we see in these signs in the, in, in the book of Exodus is what the world looks like without the Word of God and without the Spirit of God. And what I can tell you is life is always better with His Word and His Spirit. Uh, you probably have a doctor and you probably go to your doctor and uh, if, if you're one of those people who are really health conscious, you'll go to your doctor uh, once a year for a physical. I won't ask how many people do that, but I try. And uh, the doctor usually has some recommendations. You know, maybe you need to eat less salt. Uh, maybe you need to lose a few pounds. Maybe you need to take some vitamins. Maybe you need to get some exercise. Uh, maybe you need to get some exercise. Uh, maybe you need to get some exercises. <laughs> kind of like that. And, and uh, of course, I wish I could say that every time a doctor who is concerned about our health gives us something to do that we always do it. Sometimes we're a year back later and, and uh, he can tell by the data. <laughs> Not much has changed here. And uh, so if, if all of a sudden he says, I, I see a blockage in your heart, it isn't the doctor smiting the person with the blockage because they didn't listen to the advice that was given. It's the natural consequences of living certain ways. A lot of people blame God for striking them with something when in actuality we're just experiencing the consequences of our actions or the actions of others against us. The signs reveal something about God, it tells us who He is, opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, and to rescue people that regardless of what we feel trapped in or hemmed in by or limited in, that God's intention is to bring us into a life, not that just lasts forever, but is full. That's the grace of God. And we find it in the life of Moses. Would you bow your heads this morning? Father, it is so easy to dismiss the many gifts you have in our lives. It would have happened anyway someone else provided that it was just the luck of the draw we can have all these rationales for ignoring what have been incredible gifts from you would you help us spot identify discern the incredible generosity you've given to us in our life and the gifts that you have poured into our lives so that we understand it's revealing something about you and would you help our heart not only be drawn to you, but others as well. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand this morning.